All right, we already talked about a lot of what each player needs to see in the opening. Joshua, I imagine, is going to go first. He is the higher seeded player at the 19th seed. Matthew is at the 24th seed. And I imagine Joshua wants to go first in this game. So uh, Joshua is running quite a few one drop characters. He's playing a couple Pascals, a couple Trinabox followers, um, even Cinderella. So I expect to see one of those in the beginning. Oh, it looks like Matthew's actually deciding to go first yeah. on this one. Uh, and talking about, you know, being aggressive and going right early and, and deck adaptations, Pascal uh, is a fun little card that's run uh, in a lot of decks right now, but I don't think you see it terribly often in Ruby Amethyst. So it's fun to see here uh, as a one drop and Joshua responding with his own Pascal. Um, cards are great if they have evasive, uh, unless your opponent has one as well. Yeah, it's very funny when we see these Pascals sort of staring at each other because until somebody decides to exert one like Matthew's doing, then it's like you said, they both have evasive, uh, but when everything has evasive, nothing has evasive. And Matthew actually responds. <laughs> responds by saying, look, your Pascal can sit there and threaten my Pascal, but my Pascal has a Madame M snake chasing it, and he's trying to get out of here. <laughs> so he's going to quest and bounce right back to Matthew's hand out of harm's way from Joshua's Pascal. So here we go, taking a look at Piglet. Uh, Piglet is a, is a fun little aggressive card. Uh, it only has one lore, um, but when... Uh, you have two characters on board, it gets an additional two lore, can get quest for three. In this instance, though, going to the Inkwell and a Kuzco coming on board, Kuzco is a one-two with one lore. Uh, when it's banished, however, uh, its owner gets to draw a card. Now, I want to highlight something. We do see Joshua's hand, and we've talked about the engine that he has built in this deck with Perdita, being able to bring back some really strong cards like Piglet and like Cusco. We see that the Perdita is in hand, and we also see another Piglet is in hand. Uh, that might be why he was able to ink the first Piglet to begin with. And we also see Cusco on board. Cusco does a great job of replacing itself. So as soon as Cusco goes into the discard, Joshua will get to draw a card uh, once Cusco is banished. But Perdita can bring Cusco right back from the discard pile back into play, uh, allowing Cusco to pair with things like Merlin Crab to trade up or even just push his lore lead by questing, knowing that if Matthew wastes a turn challenging Cusco, uh, Matthew's not questing and the Cusco's going to go straight to the discard and, Math and Joshua might have the Perdita to just bring him right back again. Yeah, I do think in this matchup, Joshua is probably happy to take this uh, game long. Um, and wants to take this game into a point where he, he takes over the board with some of his Mufasas and, and some of his cards where he gets a lot of value out of it. So at this point, having a Kuzco go to the discard pile that he can recur to get some card draw off in the early game is I think what he wants to do more than getting that more aggressive piglet on the board and trying to quest early. Yeah, and we talk about this kind of opening that we might want to see from Matthew playing something like a Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfer, a couple of evasive cards to uh, get an early lore lead. And I feel like that Pascal played by Joshua sort of stopped this game plan. Uh, maybe Matthew didn't have the Mickey, or sorry, the Minnie Mouse Silas Surfer in hand anyway, but I don't think Matthew is starting as fast as he would like to against a deck like this for the reasons you just said. I think Joshua is looking to go into the late game if he can because he has those recursion um, abilities through Perdita. He has cards like Mufasa that he can play uh, that can continue to quest or challenge or really do anything. Uh, and then use his ability when banished or when leaving to uh, take a character from the top of the deck and put it onto the board. So here we go. Getting that crab down on turn three allows Matthew to sing friends from the other side, get a few more cards, and here we see him taking the line I think that we expected if it was available to him, and that's going wide uh, with characters that can push the lore lead, um, getting a Pascal on board again. Um, and one thing to mention about Joshua is he doesn't have a lot of removal other than challenging. Um, there's nothing that does damage to his opponent's characters or even really bounces his opponent's characters. Um, it's really challenging or nothing, and so if Matthew can build up a wide board, um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for Joshua, and he's going to have to be the player responding uh, to Matthew's aggression. Yeah, that's a great point, Liam. And something that I find interesting in this deck is an Amethyst card that we see quite frequently that helps Amethyst with this problem of having to challenge characters because they have so little removal is uh, Pinocchio. Um, and there aren't any Pinocchios in Joshua's deck list. Now, the Fairy Godmother that we do see on board has a similar ability when a Cinderella card is played, but Joshua is only playing four Cinderella Barroom Sensation, so you have to sort of combo that together if you want to force Matthew to exert one of his cards that are readied. So if I, I agree with you. If Matthew can go really wide here and make it difficult for Joshua to respond because he doesn't have options to deal with a wide board, he may be able to just overwhelm Joshua's engine that he's working with and squeak his way into 20 lore. 
No, absolutely. Uh, Fairy Godmother here removing the crab. I think this is a, an interesting play. It does two things uh, for Joshua. One, uh, it does get the crab off the board to avoid any more bounce shenanigans, uh, allowing uh, him to give Challenger three to one of his cards. But it also removes a three-cost singer from the board. And if I'm looking at this game, I think Joshua has the feeling that Matthew doesn't quite have the cards he needs uh, using friends to draw. And so uh, if Matthew has drawn into another friend from the other side, would love to sing it right now, uh, but that nine's not available anymore with that three cost off the board. Yeah, I also really like this Fairy Godmother because of her stats. She is a three, four, I believe, just at three cost. So she can trade really well into that crab, surviving the challenge and uh, being able to take another challenge from one of Matthew's characters or challenge again. We also see Joshua play the Peter Pan Shadow a card we haven't Great seen card. for quite a while. It's an evasive card uh, with Rush, I believe, and it gives other Rush characters evasive. So even if Matthew wanted to go the route of playing the Pascals, playing the Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfers, and questing with them, he has to be wary now because something like a Madame M. Fox that has Rush uh, can gain evasive with Peter Pan Shadow on board. We see Matthew deciding to use his Pascal to challenge Joshua's Pascal, knowing that Matthew's evasive characters are essentially turned off at this point because of that Peter Pan Shadow. I think this is going to be a key card in this matchup, and it's going to really make it difficult for Matthew to get under Joshua for this game. No, that's a great point. Peter Pan's Shadow is, is a really interesting card, a great card to see here. Um, the first one we've seen today, but these are really originally popped in the meta during uh, Rise of the Floodborne, and they were they were popped in primarily to deal with Minnie Mouse stylish surfers, pairing with foxes, as you suggested, to remove those um, because they were they were getting out of control. People were getting a lot of lore off of them. So now in this current meta, they're they're additionally handy to deal with Tinkerbells and other evasive cards that people have started working in. But in this instance, serving its original purpose and serving as a counter to uh, Minnie Mouse stylish surfer, perhaps if Matthew plays is that, um, and also threatening a Pascal. Uh, Matthew, of course, choosing to trade Pascals with Joshua um, now that his Pascal isn't safe anymore. Yeah, I find it really interesting. Like you said, the Peter Pan Shadow was a counter to Ruby Amethyst mirror matches, and here we see it's not a mirror match, but we see that same technique being used against the Ruby Amethyst deck in the finals, and it's just as effective. We also see Joshua playing a Merlin Goat, which will gain Joshua a lore every time it enters and leaves play. So if Joshua has any Madame M. Snake, Madame M. Foxes that have to bounce a character back to his hand when played. He can utilize this goat to bring it in play and out of play multiple times, gaining multiple lore at a burst speed. And we see him running away already up at seven lore while Matthew is only at three currently. Another thing to highlight about Goat, I mean, we focus a lot on its lore gain ability, which I think is its, its obviously its best use, um, and you want to make maximum use of bouncing that Goat back to your hand so it enters and leaves play multiple times, but it's also a decently statted uh, for a mid-game card with four uh, strength. Uh, not a lot of willpower, but um, if you're worried about controlling your opponent's board, um, it's a card that you can put on to give yourself a little extra oomph on the challenge. Yeah, it's putting Matthew in a really difficult spot right here, because if Matthew decides to exert the Snake or the Rabbit, whether that's to challenge or to quest. Uh, the goat, if Joshua wants to, can challenge to either of them, and in fact could challenge into the rabbit, survive the challenge, and then be bounced back to hand, taking that damage off. So it puts Matthew in a really tough decision here. He wants to get rid of the Cusco because the Cusco is continuing to gain one lore every single turn, uh, and he does decide to challenge the Cusco with the snake, knowing that if the Merlin Goat does challenge into the snake, at least it will be banished as well. The Cusco, when banished, will draw a card for Joshua, so he adds another card to hand. And I really like this play from Matthew, playing a Lady Tremaine. When Lady Tremaine is played, your opponent has to choose a card to banish. So Joshua goes for the Merlin Goat here, meaning that takes away any lines of play that Joshua was going to use, like bouncing the goat or challenging the snake back. And it also leaves a two lore character on board. So in a game where you're trying to race your opponent to 20, like Lorcana, anytime you can get an effect out of a card and then you have a card with two or more lore, it feels really good. Matthew now uh, able to use Lady Tremaine to get some more lore, catch up to Matthew's eight here, um, and just a really great play. And as we mentioned, if Matthew is able to, to start going wide a bit here, dropping three, four, or five characters on the board, Joshua does not have any way to mass remove characters other than challenging. No, and Matthew's doing a great job at that because even the characters that he's Exerting. Joshua can challenge the Merlin Rabbit if he wants with Peter Pan Shadow, but Peter Pan Shadow only has two strength. So the only thing that it can banish is a Madame M Snake, but the Madame M Snake would banish the Peter Pan Shadow in response to the challenge. Uh, but we do see the Perdita come out for Joshua, bringing that Cusco back into play. Just like we talked about earlier in the game, Cusco is going to be troublesome because you can think of Cusco as a little lore gainer. Like he can exert every turn for really no um, detriment 
detriment to you. And if the opponent challenges Cusco and banishes him, you can draw a card. But so long as Perdita's on board, all you have to do next turn is uh, exert the Perdita or quest with the Perdita and then bring the Cusco right back. And the problem just never seems to go away. I think Matthew is going to have to find an answer to this Perdita uh, with, or else it's going to get out of control. Yeah, we're now seeing the payoff for putting that Cusco uh, in play early on turn two, getting it into his discard pile so we can bring it back and get another card off of it. And Matthew does exactly what we just said, playing the Madame Medusa, seeing the threat that Perdita will cause uh, using Madame Medusa's ability to banish Perdita in play. Madame Medusa can banish a card that has three strength or less when played. Uh, and so we go back to Matthew just building that wide board, spreading his characters out, questing with him every turn that he can, uh, and he is slowly catching up to Joshua and slowing Joshua down at the same time. Yeah, Joshua questing that Peter Pan's shadow again, picking up another two lore. Um, it's a bit of a race now. Um, Joshua, I, I'm sure, hoping to get another character with two or more lore on the board. Perhaps a Mufasa, uh, I know, is a card that he would love to draw into at this point. Um, and here we have a Pascal uh, going wide here, and a Piglet, and a Cinderella. So really going wide. Um, now, at this point, it's worth noting we are uh, beyond turn six. Uh, so Matthew um, able to ink a card, and then uh, we all know what happens on turn seven in Ruby decks. Yeah, I think Matthew is really looking to be prepared here, if he can, to completely banish all characters in play. Matthew could quest with all of his characters, gaining a total of five lore, bringing him up just past Joshua at 13, and then play the be prepared and pass the turn, uh, removing all of these characters for Joshua. I don't think Joshua has any cards in his hand, so he would draw a card off of the Cusco, and then he would draw a card for turn, and then that's all that he would have to work with. And we do see all of the characters being quested here. It's an indicator. Liam, do you think it's coming? I, I think that's what we in the business call an indicator, and here it is. Here it is, the Be Prepared. Absolutely. And, you know, when you're, when you're playing Ruby decks, uh, oftentimes I, I like to think of turn six and beyond as the second phase of the game, because that's when the Lady Tremains, the Madame Medusas, the Be Prepared, the Scars, all of that comes online, and now you really have to plan around those threats, where in the early game, you can be a little bit more aggressive and go wide. Yeah, and now Joshua is really just playing off whatever he draws off of the top of his deck. We see him play a Rapunzel and a Cusco, and I don't think this is the scariest thing that Joshua can be playing right now. I think Matthew has an ability to answer it with things like a Madame Medusa we see being played, banishing the Rapunzel, also playing a Rafiki that he can use to challenge the Cusco when played. Joshua draws another Cusco to play, uh, and they're going to gain a couple lore. They're also going to give Joshua another card when Matthew decides to challenge with him, if he decides to challenge with him, or instead maybe decides to race. He's building quite a big board. Oh, that yeah. mini-match style of surfer, such a good play here with two lore on the board. Um, I think that puts uh, player two, I think that puts game on the board right now, uh, forcing Joshua to respond uh, to Matthew's board state. Otherwise, Matthew takes the game next turn. Yeah, Joshua has to ch uh, challenge and banish one of Matthew's characters if he wants to keep Matthew from winning next turn. And even then, only if you only take out one lore, we've said it multiple times across this two days, all Matthew needs is a Merlin Goat. You mm -hmm. could, he could get to 19 lore, play Merlin Goat, and then that would be game. And there's just not a lot of removal. So Joshua double challenging with the Kuzco's, uh, challenging and banishing Rafiki, um, sending it to the discard pile and buying himself another turn, playing a snake uh, to bounce Kuzco and bring Kuzco back onto the board, um, giving him three lore on board. Yep, and we see Matthew just pushing his lore lead, questing with Minnie Mouse, Madame Medusa, and Rabbit. Currently, Joshua does not have an evasive character on board, which means he's going to have a really difficult time dealing with this Minnie Mouse, also playing a snake that's going to stay ready, so it's going to be especially difficult for Joshua to answer that because Amber Steele doesn't have great answers for readied characters. No, no, it does not. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a bind. Um, passing it back to Josh, we'll see if he can draw anything that can answer this board state. Um, and it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, it looks like Matthew has taken game one of this final series. He came out swinging. He came out aggressive, just like we said. I should have said, let's get down to business, man. Oh, I completely yes. missed oh, that my one. Goodness. Uh, how did we, how did how we did not we use that line this? all weekend? I have no idea. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's okay. We're here in the finals. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chernobog's minions immediately hit the inkwell to play another Chernobog's minions. Pretty strong start from Joshua. 
Just, it's nice to see that one cost. Nice to open up with a character on the play, especially a character that can both gain you a lore and draw you a card if you want to. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great little versatile card, and it's even better when you know that in the later game you can get it back again. So um, it's a great card that Joshua wants to get on the board. And So this is an opening that we saw in the semifinals also. Chernobog's minion serving multiple functions for Joshua here. Uh, one, it can draw him a card if you'd like and get him a lore. Um, it going to his discard pile and being able to, to bring it back later. But two, it kind of serves as a Rafiki counter where Matthew now can't use his Rafiki to gain lore um, in perpetuity. Uh, Joshua able to challenge that Rafiki and remove it for free. Yeah, and it looks like uh, that's exactly what Joshua does. He quests with it, and then Rafiki should be able to challenge and banish the Trinobog's followers. So we'll see if he does that and what he follows up with, because if Matthew's holding on to something like a Madabim Snake, um, he may not be able to take that line. He might actually have to leave the Trinobog's followers there, quest with the Rafiki, and then play the Madabim Snake just to get a two-drop on board, because uh, you can't play Madabim Snake unless you can bounce a character back to your hand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Again, we, we see a Kuzco on turn two, and both of these cards, you know, as we highlighted last game, uh, Kuzco and Shredderbox Followers are cards that you like to see on the board uh, multiple times if you can, and Perdita allows Joshua to do that. So um, in the early game here, one of the things Joshua is, is figuring out is what do I want to put into my discard pile uh, to feed my Perdita later uh, when she comes into play? And so that's part of this early game plan, and Joshua getting two cards I think that he's very happy to bring back here. Absolutely, and I think this is really an interesting play for Matthew. Rather than challenging the Trinobog followers with his Rafiki, and the Rafiki being banished from challenging the Trinobog followers, he instead inks the Madam of Snake, develops a Cusco, and passes the turn. Yeah, he's definitely playing a more control line, probably leaving that Rafiki ready uh, to challenge uh, a stronger character if that becomes available. Um, but here it allows Joshua to quest again with the Trinobug's followers, and Joshua is now going to banish it uh, to draw a card, activating that ability. Um, and getting an additional card. Yeah, and Joshua deciding not to exert the Cusco uh, or quest with the Cusco, knowing that the Rafiki is still there and can challenge the Cusco. Rafiki wouldn't be banished in the challenge because Cusco only has one strength while Rafiki has two willpower. So uh, Joshua can't quite push his lore lead yet with that Rafiki staring down Joshua's board. Now, this fairy godmother being on the board is interesting. You know, this is the small fairy godmother, 3-4, uh, decently statted uh, with one lore, but it's a shift target for the Floodborn, uh, Floodborn Grandmother, which has an awesome ability giving uh, your characters a challenger, and then if they're banished in a challenge, they go back to your hand. Yeah, it's especially great because she is a shift character, which means, and she only shifts her two at that, mm -hmm. so you can shift the Fairy Godmother, and her ability activates on quest, so you would be able to quest with Fairy Godmother the turn that Fairy Godmother is shifted onto the little one, uh, like Liam just said, giving everything challenger plus three, and then bouncing back to hand when banished in a challenge. We've seen so many cards that Joshua has played that benefit from being in play and being banished in play. So being able to bring them back into your hand to just replay them immediately uh, can create a lot of value in that scenario. For cards like Kuzco sitting on board, which can which can uh, get a little bit stronger challenge into Matthew's characters, uh, get a card and then return to your hand. Absolutely. We see Matthew thinking through his turn three play really hard. Uh, this, ma this match is untimed. It is the finals, so we want to give these players enough time to think through the correct plays, the best play lines that they have. We see him questing with the Cusco and then using a Madame M Fo or playing a Madame M Fox to bounce the Cusco back to hand so that Josh or Joshua cannot challenge the exerted Cusco. It's really, really fascinating watching this game play out. These players, both at the top of their game, with decks they know very well, um, trying to think through the, the ideal lines of play. And interestingly, you know, normally you want, one of these players wants to be the aggressor. They're trying to figure out who the aggressor is. Here, neither one has been able to take really an aggressive line, each putting characters on board to kind of match the other one and leaving them staring at each other across the field. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about how strong Cusco can be just because it's a character that you can usually quest with and you're fine with that, it being banished and drawing you a card, um, and then bringing it back with something like Perdita. Uh, Joshua may not have a Perdita in hand, and also that Rafiki just sitting there is threatening 
making very favorable trades into the Cusco. And just in the opposite sense, Joshua has that fairy godmother sitting there that can make pretty favorable trades as well into Matthew's board. Uh, and so we're sort of at a stalemate here. We do see Joshua decide to exert the Cusco and offer up the challenge to Matthew if Matthew wants to take it. Madam and Fox now singing friends from the other side. Friends on the other side is such a great card in Amethyst. We've seen it since set one, um, and it simply says draw two cards. It's probably... <laughs> no strings attached. Yeah, no strings attached. You just get to draw two cards, probably one of the stronger Amethyst cards printed because, I mean, having more cards than your opponent is pretty good. More cards is better. It's nice to have friends. It is amazing to have friends, <laughs> and Amethyst has plenty of them. <laughs> Looks like the players are trying to clear something up. Matthew's trying to ask a question to our judges. And again, which, which is fantastic. I have to kudos to our judges uh, who are sitting here making sure everything's going right. You know, when you play uh, games at this level um, and these stakes are on the line, it's nice to, to be confident that everything in ha is happening in the game according to the rules um, and that you're comfortable that it was a, it was a fair game. So having the judges there uh, to ask questions, uh, these really professional judges who know the rules inside and out, to ask these questions of uh, is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. It's always nice to have them handy to clear up rules that you don't know because although we all love this game, there's some very intricate interactions that can happen and not all of us know all of those intricate inter interactions and the judges have uh, decided to learn those things for us so that they can help us play this game to our best ability. We do see Matthew playing this Cusco that he bounced back earlier with the Madame M. Fox. Looks like he considered challenging with the Rafiki there. Um, thinking about whether to remove that Cusco or not, um, and now thinking, thinking second thoughts. You know, it's, it's so fascinating. When you play these games, you know, especially at this level, um, there it is challenging the Cusco, uh, Cusco then allowing Joshua to draw a card. Um, you come to these turns sometimes where you have two different directions you could go, two different plays you can make, which will take your next few turns in wildly different paths. And so sometimes in the mid game here, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot on the line, but the players are thinking so carefully about which way they want, you know, the, their subsequent turns to go. Um, and so you agonize over those decisions sometimes, even when uh, you're far away from 20 lore and the game is far from over. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite things about this Lorcana is just how intricate this game can be. The core rules are relatively simple to pick up. They're easy to learn, but the actual gameplay itself can be very complex. And something as simple as challenging the Cusco with the Rafiki on this turn or inking certain cards instead of others can make or break these games. They can come back to bite you later in the game when you need a specific card that you you put in your inkwell or decided to make a trade that you shouldn't have because now Joshua can challenge and banish the Rafiki and you might need the Rafiki later to have challenged something more threatening. Here we have Joshua questing, scooping up a lure with that rabbit. We see a very uh, familiar play, questing with the rabbit, bouncing the rabbit back to hand with Madame Mim Fox, doing the nice uh, Merlin Mim chase that we see in the <laughs> movies. It was a chase, uh, it, was, it was a card combo, uh, so obvious and that they put it in the starter deck uh, so that we could all play with it, and players have carried it from that starter deck into tournament play, and we see it played out here. Followed by a piglet. Uh, piglet, a card with one lore, um, but it gets plus two lore if there are two other characters on the board, turning it from a, a relatively inconsequential card to a scary card pretty quickly. Yeah, especially because... Um Joshua has the ability to play quite a few characters at once. Uh, he plays a couple expensive cards, but right now the Madam and Fox is exerted, so even if Matthew decides to challenge the Madam and Fox with his Madam and Fox um, and remove that so that Piglet no longer has two lore, all Joshua has to do is play a second character that next turn, and Piglet's got that two lore right back again. But instead, it looks like Matthew in, uh, sings Friends on the Other Side with 
Madam M. Fox, and then finds a Merlin Crab, decides to play Merlin Crab, which would give his Cusco challenger plus three, allowing him a challenge for four total strength so that you can banish the Madam M. Fox, which is really important because you would rather trade with your Cusco than you would your own Madam M. Fox. When Cusco's banished, Matthew gets to draw a card, um, and that Madam M. Fox gets to stay in play with all of that strength, four strength on Madam M. Fox, so that if Joshua decides to challenge the Madam M. Fox to banish it with something like his Fairy Godmother, uh, the Fairy Godmother will also be banished in that challenge. Hey, absolutely. Crab, a really versatile card, which allows you to use some, some shenanigans like that, um, some tricks, and uh, definitely using it to maximum effect here. You know, the fox, uh, not only is it a stronger character to have on the board, but, it, but it's important to, to keep for a couple of reasons. One, it is a singer for cards like Friends on the other side. We've seen two played, but there could be others. But two, um, you can do weird things like fox loops, where you bounce foxes for other foxes doing challenges and stuff. So um, giving you a little more utility on the board than Cusco. Absolutely. It is a... Um a package that we see play in Amethyst all the time, just for those reasons that you just mentioned, being able to pick up and put down characters. But I mean, even the utility of something like Madame and Fox having Rush, being able to challenge immediately while using the crab to give something challenger or pick up the rabbit to draw a bunch of cards or pick up the goat to gain a bunch of lore. There's just a ton of utility in that package, and it makes total sense why it's in just about every Amethyst build that we see. Yeah, here's a fun little play. Uh, this is one we highlighted last game where we mused about whether there were Cinderella's in this deck. But here, Fairy Godmother has one ability, which allows you to exert an opponent's character when a Cinderella comes into play. Um, and lo and behold, Joshua plays a Cinderella to exert Merlin Crab and then challenge with the Fairy Godmother uh, to remove the crab, leaving her with one remaining willpower. So a fun little combo there, and probably one that we haven't seen a tournament play terribly often. And here it is in the finals of the first uh, North American Morcana Challenge. And you know, one thing that I think I'm just now noticing about Joshua's deck list I'm not sure that Joshua plays any actual songs. So I think that the Cinderella is purely in here to combo with the Fairy Godmother I think that's right. using her ability, um, which is really interesting, but makes sense. He's playing a Mufasa, or he's playing a deck that plays four Mufasas, playing a deck that plays four Perditas, and he is playing one Chernobox follower. So it is a very challenger heavy, or sorry, character heavy deck where you want characters in your discard pile. You don't want to be hitting anything other than characters off of those Mufasas when the Mufasas get banned. So it's just a pretty interesting thing there that he decides to run the combo of Cinderella and Fairy Godmother, and it seems to be working for him. It definitely worked here, and, you know, Cinderella to one cost can be uh, brought back from the discard pile with Perdita, perhaps allowing you to do that combo several times. So um, it's, a, it's a fun little trick. We do see Joshua finally taking a little bit of board control here, uh, removing some of what Matthew was working with. Matthew decided to ink a Minnie Mouse Stylish Surfer and banishing the piglet in a challenge. Can't let that piglet continue to gain lore. It's got too much lore. Also going to play Madame and Medusa to get rid of that uh, Merlin rabbit. You don't want that rabbit bouncing around drawing a bunch of cards for Joshua if you can help it. No, as you said last game, Brandon, you know, or we talked about earlier, uh, the rabbit, it does feel bad banishing the rabbit, giving your opponent a card. But if you give your opponent a card off of it and they've gotten two cards off the rabbit, that is the, the minimum they can get. Um, if they do some bounce shenanigans and draw multiple cards, uh, it feels even worse. So removing it is probably the best option. Absolutely. And uh, when the rabbit leaves, the rabbit comes back. Uh, so many rabbits. Joshua just has another that he's able to play to draw another card. And he will use the Cinderella to finish off the Madame Mim Fox, getting it out of play. Now, we talked about last game how we moved uh, into a second phase of the game, uh, I think, with Ruby when we get to turn six. And here, uh, just like we talked about Matthew hitting his uh, one of his six-cost removal cards with Madame Medusa. So now, uh, on Matthew's next turn, the removal options are really going to open up, and we're at a point in the game where Joshua has to think a little bit more carefully about what he's putting on the board and making vulnerable. Yeah, uh, Liam, has the stream frozen or something? I could have sworn that just a couple turns ago, um, Matthew got rid of the piglet and the rabbit, and they continue to still be on the screen somehow. I, I, there's just... <laughs> looks like every there's a, time... There's a glitch in the Matrix. Yeah, there's a glitch in the Matrix. Matthew continues to remove these characters, and Joshua just seems to have them to play again, except this time he does get a Pascal. Pascal will, of course, have evasive because there's another character in play. And uh, Pascal and Piglet sort of play off of each other. They each care about other characters being in play. Pascal having evasive, Piglet gaining extra lore. We do see Matthew play another Medusa to get rid of that rabbit, saying, "You did it. I did it once, and I'll do it again. I don't want you drawing any extra cards off of this rabbit. 
I do think these these might be key plays down the road because uh, this deck, I think, Joshua's deck, has a lot of cards that are low cost and it has the ability to go wide, but at the cost of cards in your hand. And without those rabbits and being able to use them to maximum effect, I think this deck could stall out. So getting rid of those rabbits could uh, pay off. But here we have the Mufasa, which he failed to find in game one. Mufasa, uh, just a great card, uh, two lore on the board, so it can, it can quest and get you closer to victory. But more importantly, when it's banished in a challenge uh, and goes to your discard pile, you can look at the top card of your deck, and if it's a character card, you can put it in play for free. Yeah, it is a really strong card, especially in a, a deck that is so character heavy and plays quite a few characters that you'd like to see in play. Playing those, we've talked about the Cuscos, the Piglets, gaining a bunch of lore, even something like a Rapunzel. If a Rapunzel gets pulled off of the top and you have a damaged character, you can immediately heal something and draw a bunch of cards. So, um, Also, another fun interaction here is the Madame Mim thing as well. If you pull a Madame Mim Snake or Madame Mim Fox off of the top of your deck, then you can bounce one of your maybe exerted characters that are vulnerable uh, that Matthew decided not to challenge if he decides to get rid of the Mufasa first. Uh, so Mufasa, I think, is a really great card in this deck for those reasons. Uh, one thing I have to correct, I, I did think, I misspoke and said that Mufasa has to be banished in a challenge for that to work. It's not, it's banished, period. Oh, yeah, um, banished at all. Yeah, which which is one of the reasons it's so popular, um, because when you're playing a deck, for example, uh, with Be Prepared, and your opponent clears the board, that leaves you immediately with a character on the board, um, allowing you to b build your board state faster than your opponent. Yeah, that's why I love the Mufasa plays in board states like this. Joshua is putting a lot of pressure on Matthew right now with both the Piglet, the Pascal, and then decides to play Mufasa because because he's building a wide board, knowing that Matthew has enough ink to play a Be Prepared, and it's uh, Matthew is incentivized to play a Be Prepared right now to get rid of all of these characters, but he also knows that that will come at the cost of banishing the Mufasa and potentially drawing something off the top to immediately be put into play. Um, so luckily for Matthew, the Piglet and the Pascal are exerted. Of course, he can't challenge the Pascal because the Pascal has evasive, but he can banish that Piglet that has three lore and has been pushing Joshua closer and closer to 20. I mean, Joshua's already halfway to his win condition. Joshua here taking a look at the cards in his discard pile, spreading them out, showing both Matthew uh, and himself what's in there. Uh, this is important for a variety of reasons. One is the Perdita we talked about, which can pull cards back. But the other, um, as we mentioned earlier and you saw uh, in previous rounds, there's one copy of Chernabog uh, in this deck which cares about characters in your discard pile because it makes it a lot cheaper to play. Yeah, and I'll be honest, Chernabog would be quite a difficult card for Matthew to take care of. Ruby has a lot of ways to outright banish characters, but in Matthew's deck list, there's only about six cards that can actually outright banish, or not even banish, or just get rid of the Chernabog. He's running three Be Prepareds, which of course he can use to do that, but we've already talked about how the Mufasa on board makes that a pretty difficult play or tricky play if we do see a Chernabog come out. He's also playing a couple Yzma, um, Sar uh, what? scary beyond all reason. Beyond all reason, thank you, Liam. Uh, that you can choose a character and shuffle that character back into the player's deck, and then that player draws two cards. That would be another way to get rid of the Chernabog. Um, or he is Matthew's also playing a single copy of Lady Tremaine, which uh, your opponent has to choose a character to banish when Lady Tremaine is played. So you would have to have just Chernabog on Joshua's board in order to even do that. So not a ton of options for Matthew if that is in the cards. I'm not sure if Joshua has that in his hand or not or if we're anywhere close to that, but something to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. Joshua here questing for three uh, with two characters. One that he doesn't mind losing terribly much in the Mufasa and two uh, the Pascal, which is, should be fairly safe from a challenge. Yeah, the fun thing about Mufasa is it's just sort of teasing or tempting Matthew to say, you need to banish me, but I know you don't want to banish me. I'm going to continue to gain two lore every turn that you allow me to until you banish me, and then when you do, uh, I'm going to benefit off of it. Now, this is a very aggressive play, and it's a little bit risky because what it's opened up for Matthew is the ability to challenge the Mufasa, get the card off the top deck, and then play a Be Prepared, leaving Mufasa not there um, on the board to get a character back when the when the board is wiped. So um, here uh, is exactly what Matthew's doing, is banishing Mufasa, bringing back a Perdita, which immediately uh, gives him the effect of pulling a character of two costs or less uh, back from the discard pile to play, Joshua choosing Cusco, a card that will get him a card when it's banished. So now Matthew has the ability to play the Be Prepared without triggering the Mufasa. Joshua, of course, knew this and chose to pursue the lore, getting him to 15, um, knowing that this was an option, and deciding at this moment to strike, um, and I think really push his lore total. Yeah. 
this is one of those situations where he's telling Matthew, you either have it or you don't. If you don't have it, I take this game and we go on to game three. If you do have it, then I think that's why he chose the Cusco in his discard rather than something like the Piglet because if Matthew decides to play Be Prepared, both the Rabbit and the Cusco uh, would be banished and both of those would draw a card off of Be Prepared, uh, giving Joshua some more cards in hand. And we do see that Be Prepared being played after Matthew played a Madame M Snake. And I missed what, what he picked up. What did he pick uh, up there? He picked up a Madame Medusa. Okay, took, there we go. Yeah, Which he, definitely he, makes sense. Just keeping another it. answer uh, for whatever Joshua has to play after this. So here we are, clean slates, over to Joshua to rebuild the board. Yeah, having refilled his hand just a little bit, like we mentioned earlier with the Cusco and the Rabbit, we'll see what he drew into. We see another Mufasa coming in alongside a Cusco and a Cinderella. Man, Joshua just refills his board so quickly. So quickly, playing the Mufasa. And of course, Joshua knows that the Madame Medusa is over there um, and able to banish something, but playing the Mufasa saying, you can remove it. Uh, and, and try your luck. Yep, try it again. We'll see what we pull off the top. Joshua checking Matthew's discard right now, probably seeing how many removal options Matthew might still have because uh, this is sort of a game of attrition. Uh, Joshua's going to continue to play characters that continue to bring back characters or bring other characters into play that he doesn't have to play for or that he doesn't have to pay for um, and Matthew is going to have to remove them especially because Joshua has such a lore lead on Matthew right now Matthew doesn't have the luxury of keeping these characters in play and letting him quest too much because I mean Joshua is an amethyst and we know what card is an amethyst uh, it's the goat <laughs> it is the goat <laughs> it's the goat <laughs> And that's the thing, you know, when you look at these Amethyst decks that run goats, especially goat bounces, you know, 20 lore is the win condition, but, but 18 is really kind of the danger area. Uh, 17 even, 17, 18, 19. So uh, Joshua's looking to push his lore there, and at that point, if we can just draw the game out, he'll eventually draw into a goat, which he can use to win the game. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that Matthew has to keep in mind. Um, and we see him trying to slow down Joshua a little bit by playing the rabbit, also playing the Madame Medusa to uh, banish some of Joshua's characters. And we see Joshua, I mean, it just makes sense. He's pushing his lore. He's so close to 20. He wants to get as close as he can, keeping the aggression on Matthew, trying to finish out this game. Oh, okay, this is an interesting play. Joshua playing the Peter Pan Shadow, which has evasive, uh, and Matthew is going to really struggle to be able to get rid of this. Joshua is showing game on board with a total of uh, four or five, six lore total, so Matthew would need to get rid of four lore on the board, which is going to be difficult because some of that four lore is a Mufasa carrying two of it. We know that if Mufasa gets banished, then another character is likely to come into play also. Yeah, absolutely. Peter Pan's Shadow, we talked before about the versatility, giving your, your rush characters evasive. Um, but here it's serving as a lore battery. Uh, it has two lore um, and uh, just one more two lore character for Matthew to deal with. Um, really looking for another be prepared here probably um, is, is his best option. Yeah, and even after a be prepared, Joshua's going to turn a card over off the top of his deck and play it immediately. Matthew thinking really hard about his lines, what his outs are, seeing how he needs to play this turn to save this game. Matthew starts by challenging the Cusco, banishing it, and uh, picking the rabbit back up with Madame Snake, I imagine, to uh, draw a card, see if he draws into an answer. He can also play the rabbit again to draw another card to try to find another answer to just slow Joshua down a little bit. Unfortunately, you play Rabbit one more time, you draw another card. Even if you ink this turn, you have five. Most of your removal options are at six. So really, at this point, forced to use whatever he has in his hand. Uh, banishing Pan's Shadow there, but still leaving three lore on the board, um, which is enough to close out the game. Here goes Madame Medusa into Fox, removing that one lore. Now you have Mufasa standing alone um, with two lore, not able to close out the game on his own, um, but still... Uh, getting you that much closer. Yeah, Matthew had to get rid of that Peter Pan Shadow first because Madame M. Fox has Rush and Peter Pan Shadow gives your Rush characters evasive. So uh, it was nice for him to, it was nice for Matthew to have that Madame Medusa to get rid of the Peter Pan Shadow, remove the evasive from Madame M. Fox so then he could challenge it with his other Madame Medusa that he had played previously uh, and remove that from board, leaving just the Mufasa, which can only quest for two. But like we've said, uh, if Joshua finds something like a Merlin Goat, 
Uh, that's all that it's going to take to end this game. We see Matthew playing a Maleficent Sorcerer, which lets him draw a card when he is played. Um, and that is all of his ink, I believe. So he's deciding whether what he wants to do with the rest of his turn. He's just going to pass. We'll see what Joshua picks up here. He immediately quests for two with Mufasa. It doesn't seem like he has a goat in hand. Otherwise, I imagine we would have seen it already. Okay, and Joshua is just going to play a little bit wide, force Matthew to get rid of all of these characters, which is going to be a little tough. Matthew could do this again with the same way he did before, challenging the Mufasa, seeing what Mufasa pulls off the top, and then playing a Be Prepared if he has it to completely uh, wipe Joshua's board. We see him challenge the Mufasa with the Mana Medusa, pull off a Fairy Godmother off That's of the a top. Nice card she to pull off the top there. Exerted. I think Matthew has 11 ink total, so he can play four ink worth of cards before uh, he has to have to be prepared to play. And, and there, there it is, is. The be prepared. He had it. He had to be prepared. Uh, we'll see if he has anything else in his hand. He still has a couple ink, I believe, that he could at least develop something, get it on board before Joshua is able to play other things as well. And we see he decides to play Merlin Rabbit, draw a card, and uh, just dig a little bit deeper into his deck, hopefully keeping or finding some answers for whatever Joshua is about to play next. You know, this game is close. It's still not unwinnable for Matthew, believe it or not. You know, you always play to your outs. Uh, Matthew here doing exactly that, putting things on the board, drawing another card. Um, there's a lot of removal options, you know, that Ruby has available. And so um, he has an answer for single characters that are dropped on the board and, and several of the B-prepareds. Of course, you know, we keep talking about the goat and how important uh, the goat is to this deck. But for all we know, all four goats can be stacked onto the bottom uh, of this deck just due to bad luck. Um, and so um, always play to your outs. And this, this game is still, is still in play. It's definitely happened before, and we see where Joshua's deck shines here, being to feel like constantly play wide. All he had to do here was play a Perdita. He immediately can bring a Cusco back into play, and now Matthew doesn't just have to take care of one character. So he has to take care of two, and uh, Matthew is eventually going to run out of beef repairs. He's already played quite a few Madame Medusas, and since these characters are ready, it's going to be our Perdita and Cusco specifically are ready. It makes it that much harder for Matthew to interact with him and banish them before Joshua goes to the next turn, because all Joshua needs is a single readied character that has lore and can quest uh, in order to win this game on the next turn. So we see a Mad another Madame Medusa come down to banish the Perdita, leaving the Cusco. Matthew still has to get rid of this. And the, talk, the only two cost card, exactly the right amount of ink uh, to exert that character, uh, making it challengeable, um, and Rabbit coming across there and taking care of Cusco, uh, giving Joshua a card, though, however, in the process. Yeah, I mean, I have to give props to Matthew here. He is playing this match perfectly. He's finding his outs. He's finding the lines. He's creating a lot of pressure. He has a ton of cards on board. Joshua's deck struggles a lot to play against a wide board. And if Matthew can delay this game by just a few turns, Matthew might be able to actually swing this in his favor. Currently showing five lore on the board. Pass it back to Joshua. But as you suggested earlier, you know, you only have so many answers. Um, so every time Joshua is able to drop two characters on board, uh, it's just really difficult. A lot of the answers available to Matthew right now, other than be prepared, are our spot removal. We'll, we'll banish a single card. Um, and so you have to, pending multiple of those a turn, uh, is a little tricky. Yeah. You can always pick up his Madame Medusa and play it if he has a bounce character again using the resources, uh, recycling them, which is something that Amethyst does really well. But it looks like Matthew does not have the answer, and Joshua is going to take game two. Guys, we have a game three finals match. And I have no... Let's get down to business. Let's get down to, to business. business. To win the Disney Lorcana kind of Challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't. Quite, we'll quite we'll have to well. perfect that for next time. Yeah, we'll have to practice, I guess. 
All right, both players still aren't altering their hands here. You know, one thing we've we've mentioned earlier is how important this phase of the game is, uh, choosing what to keep in your opening hand and what to discard. Games can be won or lost uh, right here uh, in this stage of the game. I think it's one of the most under-appreciated um, points of Disney Lorcana. A lot of players understand uh, about board state and how trades work and resources and efficiency, but the mulligan system in Lorcana is so generous that you have the benefit of being able to put back any card that you want from your opening hand and draw that many cards back up to seven. So if there are certain cards that are really strong in a matchup or really important that you need in a matchup, in this case, we've talked about the Mufasa, Peter Pan Shadow, something like Minnie Mouse Surfer, uh, even Madame Medusa, um, you can put back the cards that you know you don't need and dig really deep up to seven. Uh, you can essentially go 14 cards deep into your deck before the game even starts if you want to. Um, and like you said, I think games can be made or broken purely on how aggressive or uh, not aggressive you decide to mulligan. And here we go, Matthew, uh, on, on the play here, going first, opening up with a Rafiki. Probably not his ideal opening. I think he probably would be looking for something like a Pascal, being on the play, wanting to get a bit of an aggressive start. But at least the Rafiki sitting there will be able to um, hopefully keep Joshua from questing with any of his characters. We do see the Rafiki being quested with here. It's partially because Cinderella cannot challenge and banish Rafiki. Cinderella only has one strength, and Rafiki has two willpower. No, that's right. I actually think Cinderella is not the ideal opening for Joshua here. I think Joshua would much prefer to have one of his Chernobog followers, giving him the versatility to draw a card off of it or to challenge that Rafiki. Um, Cinderella in here, uh, as a one-cost character that can come back, uh, there's nothing to sing. Uh, there's no songs, uh, but also as a, as a card that works with Fairy Godmother, but um, a, a turn one play, uh, but probably not the one he wanted to see. Yeah, and we see Matthew doing something that Amethyst does really well. We've seen it all the time, playing your one-cost character, questing with that character, bouncing the character back, and Joshua follows suit, doing the exact same thing with Cinderella, snakes staring at each other. Across the board. So here, Matthew, uh, questing for one, saying, all right, Joshua, you need to respond to me. I'm going to be the aggressor. If you want to banish my snake, you can, uh, but I'm not going to let you get free lore and quest. Uh, so Matthew here definitely showing that he's, he's going to take the more aggressive line uh, if it's available to him. Yeah, especially when you're on the play um, and you are the first person that can play something like a Mad Mim snake, yours is going to drive before your opponent's. It's very advantageous for you to quest like this because now Joshua has a decision to make. He can decide, okay, do I continue to put pressure as well and try to match Matthew in this lore race by questing with my Madame M Snake and developing characters further? Or do I make this trade with his Madame M Snake to keep him from gaining any more lore? And we see him making that trade, playing the Fairy Godmother, which I kind of like here because the Fairy Godmother has great stats for a card. It is an inkable three cost, three, four, which will trade favorably into this Madame M Snake that's only a three, three. So the, uh, the Fairy Godmother will survive with one willpower left. Absolutely. The math here, very much in Joshua's favor. As you suggest, you know, with Matthew uh, taking the more aggressive approach here, you know, he'd probably like to quest with that snake if he could, but um, unfortunately, uh, Fairy Godmother shutting that down. So it's a perfect example of, you know, Matthew having a game plan, hoping to, to quest here, and Joshua shutting that down with just a well-statted character at the appropriate time. And here we see this combo again. Yeah. Um, with Cinderella coming down, uh, activating uh, the uh, ability on Fairy Godmother, which says, when a Cinderella is played, you may exert an opponent's character. So exerting the rabbit here, making it vulnerable to a challenge. I think this is a really huge play. Dare I say, maybe game winning. And I know that sounds really dramatic, but being able to exert this rabbit and deny Matthew the value that comes from having a rabbit and being able to bounce the rabbit back and forth, drawing a bunch of cards. We saw in the last game how much Matthew had to dig and draw cards to find answers to Joshua's board state. And so the fact that Matthew only was able to play the rabbit, get the one draw off of it, not even be able to quest with it, and Joshua able to deny all of that value that I'm sure Matthew was looking to get from the rabbit. Being, and then on top of that, being able to play the Madam and Fox, bounce the Cinderella back so that you can do that again. again. And a challenge with the Madam and Fox that still survives the challenge against Rabbit. I mean, I feel like that was a huge tempo shift for Joshua here. Absolutely. Having that Cinderella back in the hand, you know, now Matthew has to think about that. Anything that he plays uh, right now is vulnerable uh, to be challenged. Although Matthew says, all right, 
uh, turnabout is fair play here. I'll exert your character, making it vulnerable, and perhaps uh, we see a fox uh, of his own here. I really like this play because I feel like we are seeing two sides of the same coin. We talked earlier about how Joshua isn't playing the Pinocchio talkative puppet, which would do the same thing as this fairy godmother Cinderella play of being able to exert a character when you want to. Um, so we see both of those options happening and so Matthew exerts the fairy godmother we'll see if he decides to challenge into it and if he has something that he can uh, else something else he can challenge with it to banish it And it does look like he had a Madam M. Fox that he could play to challenge and get rid of this fairy godmother, knowing that Joshua was holding on to that Cinderella uh, and knowing that that was going to be a real problem for Matthew. Like you mentioned earlier, Liam, not being able to really play anything of value because you knew it was going to be able to be exerted by that Cinderella and fairy godmother combo. So remember how we talked about how the Mufasa is probably key in the mid-match and... Oh. <laughs> uh, key to the mid-match here, because once the options open up on turn six, Matthew can start removing things, has some really good removal, and having that Mufasa to replace itself with something off the top of the deck feels really good. Uh, what you don't necessarily like to see is the Pascal, um, a card that doesn't give you a ton of value for that Mufasa uh, when it's removed. But nonetheless, uh, able to quest here, it gets evasive because Joshua plays a couple Cuscos. Um, so getting a lore, um, but probably would have liked to see something bigger. Now, one of the risky things about Mufasa is that it can be a really strong card. It can play cards from the top of your deck that have very strong interplay abilities. Uh, sometimes it misses like this and plays a Pascal. And the most risky part about it is every, of, every one of those cards interplay exerted. And so Pascal, of course, only has evasive when there are other characters on board. There, of course, were not any other characters on board, but luckily for Joshua, Matthew also didn't have any other characters on board or any rush characters that he could play to challenge the Pascal before Joshua was able to respond with two Cuscos, ensuring that Pascal stays safe with evasive and being able to use it to his full ability. But now, of course, we're reaching turn seven. So Joshua now, you know, thinking about what to play, but knowing that be prepared is an option. So uh, Joshua, of course, you know, would love to go wide at some point and push his lore total, uh, get closer to victory, but has to think about doing that in a, in a controlled manner, uh, knowing that the be prepared is coming. Of yeah, I wonder if the Mufasa came out a little early because we talked about this and we saw it in the previous match where Joshua was, a Joshua was able to build quite a wide board and then around when turn seven came around when you're a little bit scared of a be prepared coming down you can play a Mufasa and say you can try to be prepared me but I'm immediately going to pull something off the top of my deck and play it and instead Joshua decides to play Merlin Goat gaining a lore when it enters play. Maleficent coming into play, allowing Matthew to draw a card. And another talkative puppet, exerting Merlin Goat, making it vulnerable to a challenge. And uh, we'll likely see uh, perhaps Madame Medusa come in here and remove that goat so that Joshua doesn't get any more value out of it. Yeah, and this is where uh, Merlin Goat's stats come into play, like you had mentioned earlier. The fact that Merlin Goat has four strength and banishes the Mount of Medusa when it is challenged, although you're happy to see the Merlin Goat be banished and get off of Joshua's board so that Joshua doesn't get any more value out of it, it does... It feels really bad for Matthew to have to trade his Madame Medusa. Uh, he won't be able to bounce the Madame Medusa back to hand, and that's at least one that is down that he's not going to have an answer for later in the game. Here we have Perdita, uh, another card allowing uh, Joshua to maximize the value of the cards in his deck. Pulling back a snake, uh, not a move we've seen before. A snake doesn't give you any effect when it enters or leaves play, but it's a very well-statted character. Um, and so a 3-3 now on the board uh, for free uh, with the Perdita play. Yeah, there's an interesting thing that happens when Perdita manages to bring Madame M Snake back in that normally when Madame M Snake is played, you have to bounce a character back to your hand or else the snake just becomes banished again. So you can do this really fun thing with Perdita where you pull the Madam M Snake back from the discard pile and play it, and that gives you an opportunity to take a card off of the board of yours for free back to your hand that's exerted, and we saw him do that with the Pascal. And we'd save it from the Be Prepared. And, yeah, and save it from the Be Prepared, exactly. We do see the Be Prepared come down from Matthew, clearing the board, resetting the game, uh, and this is honestly still a really tight race. Matthew is only at 6 lore, and Joshua is at 10, but, I mean, comparatively, that's not super far off, and we do see Joshua come back 
and respond with the Bertita plus Cusco combo, one that we are getting familiar with the more we watch Joshua play this deck. Absolutely. What, what I love about what Joshua did there, uh, Joshua knows the Be Prepared is an option, and he's trying to put enough lore on the board that Matthew has to play it so that Joshua can then get into to the post-Be Prepared phase and start to rebuild his board. So he could have... Uh, and there's a, another be prepared. <laughs> um, he could have, in that first scenario, used Perdita to pull back a Cusco or something else that got him some value. But instead, he did pull back the snake, bouncing a Pascal, just putting a little bit more lore on the board with Perdita, and basically forcing that be prepared. Yeah, and the fact that Matthew's already down to be prepared uh, means that Joshua can play around a little bit riskier if he wants to. Joshua's doing a very, very great job of, like you mentioned earlier, putting just enough lore on board that Matthew has to play this be prepared. He's not overextending. He's playing just enough to put enough pressure so that uh, Matthew thinks about playing a be prepared but isn't getting a ton of value off of the be prepared. So, for instance, Matthew be prepared right now. Joshua's going to draw two cards off of the rabbit and the Cusco, and he's only taking two lore off of the board, but if he doesn't do anything or doesn't get rid of any of these cards, Joshua's gaining three lore a turn, and after two or three turns, that's going to get him dangerously close to 20 lore uh, and taking this match entirely. Yeah, this, this deck is, is really shining right now, and you can see what it's trying to do. With this amount of ink on the board, uh, every time the Rabbit or the Cusco is removed, it's, it, with a be prepared or anything else, giving Joshua two cards, he can probably play those two cards with enough resources. He has enough resources to do it. So every single turn, he's playing two or more characters, it feels like, forcing Matthew to respond with significant removal and not single character removal. And Matthew doing a great job as well, using this talkative puppet, the, the uh, Pinocchio talkative puppet as best as he can, playing it and then bouncing it immediately with the Merlin, or sorry, the Madame Mim Fox so that he can challenge. And now he has that talkative puppet back in hand to do it again if he needs to answer a threat. This is not the first time we've seen Rapunzel play for the lore alone. Uh, Rapunzel has a, a great ability um, allowing you to heal a character when it comes into play and drawing cards for each damage counter removed. But here being used purely as a lore generator, I, I believe, uh, getting out on the board and threatening two lore next turn. Yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, Joshua is just doing a phenomenal job at putting just enough lore on board for it to matter, but not enough that... Uh, Matthew feels great about his options. We do see a Meta Medusa being played by Matthew, which will banish a character with three strength or less, and he chooses the Rapunzel with because the Rapunzel has two lore on it, the most lore out of any of the characters, just trying to sew Joshua down as much as possible, but Joshua just continues to tug along, or chug along, going up to 13 lore currently. Yep, and see, this is why that, that Rapunzel play was so big. Playing that character with two lore, forcing the Madame Medusa to respond to that, leaves the rabbit in play, where I'm sure Matthew would have much rather removed that um, if left to his own devices, because Joshua now getting extra value out of that rabbit, bouncing it to his hand, drawing a card, playing it again to draw a card, and giving him even more characters at his disposal uh, to flood the board. Yeah, and now it's getting really dangerous. Uh being able to bounce and replay the rabbit, like you mentioned, drawing cards, getting a piglet on board that will have plus two lore because there are two other characters on board. Right now, we're looking at a total of six lore in play on Joshua's side of the board. And we see Matthew using that talkative puppet again to exert the piglet that I'm sure he's planning to challenge. Oh, okay, so we see the Gizma being played on Matthew's own talkative First time. Uh, uh, Pinocchio talkative puppet. He knows that the talkative puppet has done a lot of work this game. It doesn't need to be banished. Um, this is a play that allows Matthew to draw two more cards, maybe bringing him closer to answers that he needs while making sure that that Pinocchio doesn't go into his discard so that hopefully he can draw into it again when he needs it to continue to slow Joshua down with the characters that he's playing. Yeah, Yzma is a very versatile card. We've seen it work into to a variety of lists here uh, once Into the Ink Lens came out. Um, it, it serves as card draw for you. It also serves as removal. Um, so in a pinch, you can remove something of your opponent's, perhaps a, a Shurnabog, um, send it back into your opponent's deck, but allowing them to draw two cards. But I think it's most often used uh, for card draw, because not only does it give you two cards, uh, but it also now has two lore, um, and it's a card you can use to drive your lore total a little bit. Man, the rabbits just do not stop. We see Joshua using one of his Merlin rabbits to banish the Madame Medusa and just playing another rabbit to draw another card. We see another piglet in play as well. Uh, this is just forcing Matthew to answer again, saying, you have to answer my board. Otherwise, I win next turn because uh, I, now I have 
Yeah, now still just six lore on board, seven lore on board currently, which will be plenty enough to get to 20 on the next turn. If Matthew can't answer, Matthew can't challenge the Pascal because Pascal has evasive. All other characters on Joshua's side of the board are readied, so Matthew's not going to be able to challenge them. I really think Matthew just has to have a be prepared here. Joshua deciding to quest with Madame M. Fox, knowing that if Matthew does challenge the Madame M. Fox with the Yzma, uh, it will also banish the Yzma, meaning that uh, the Yzma won't be able to banish or challenge or banish any of the other characters either. No, this is a this is a difficult situation. As we mentioned, you know, most of the removal in Ruby uh, is spot removal, allowing you to remove uh, a single target or single character. Um, so another be prepared. Again, we always talk about how important it is, but. Again, another be prepared would be nice. Um, we'll see if, if Matthew is able to, to find it. He is. He does have the be prepared to save him and keep this game going. Liam, this is such a tight game for the championship. I'm on the edge of my seat. Matthew finding the answers he needs when he needs them. I've, even though Joshua is really close, I feel like this game still isn't over for Matthew. No, definitely uh, still in play, but Joshua, two great answers here. You know, the rabbit, of course, getting a card uh, is always nice. Uh, you can quest for that rabbit next turn to get you a lore, but the Mufasa um, is a really rough card uh, for Matthew to see played here. Um, it has two lore, it can quest next turn, uh, but again, it's going to replace itself if Matthew manages to remove it. Maui coming into play uh, with Rush, but nothing exerted, so nothing uh, able to be challenged there. Yeah, I really like this Mufasa play from Joshua. It makes it so that even if Matthew's able to banish it, there's just another character that's going to have lore that's going to come on board. And we see Joshua playing quite a few characters out, saying, Matthew, you have to answer all of these. If not, I will win next turn. And, and there we does. have it. Wow. We have a Disney Lorcana Challenge champion. The finally. very first. Very first in North America. Wow. And